This seminar session was recorded at the Kit Plus Show at Twickenham Stadium in London on the 14th of September 2021. Kit Plus Show seminars are supported by Pebble. We'll start when you want us to start, it's up to you. We got the thumbs up. Uh, we're not being introduced or anything, no? What are, we, what are we calling this? It was something about cameras, wasn't it? Cho choosing the right camera, technology. Cho why you have to buy the most expensive camera. That's it, yep. Yes. Yep. Or do you? There, that's a, oh, just change it. Same thing. Yeah, it is really, isn't How it? How much money do you need to spend on a camera? Okay, so we can, we can start if we want. Um, Alistair. Mr. Philip Bloom. So you use cameras, do you? I do. A yeah, few. me too. Yeah, how many cameras do you think you actually own, including old ones, like, you know, anything oh my over God. a year? Uh, Antiques. Uh, more than 20? Probably. Including like old film cameras or oh anything God, like that. Oh God, it's even more then. Yeah. I know I've got a drawer that's just full of various action cams and pro GoPros and everything else that looks like a candy basket or something. How many, how many generations of GoPro do you think you go back still? All the way? Uh, I've probably got a one somewhere. Yeah. So, um, but how many of these do you actually need? If you could sell, if you had to sell, which you should do, which I should do as well, how many do you think you'd actually keep? Two. And what are they? FX9 and FX3, out of the cameras that I own personally. Okay, so... And yourself? I would probably keep maybe no more than 30. Um, you really cut it down by about, you know, 10%. Right. Um, so, yeah, I th the cameras that I use on a regular basis are the uh, A7S III, the Alpha, the Alpha One FX6, and... When I want, you know, I have a medium format and stuff like that, but they're more for just, they're not for, it depends. So I have cameras which I use for work and cameras which I work, use for, camera, for work and my own stuff and, and cameras I use for just for my own stuff, which tend to be photography cameras, yep. mostly. So, but when it comes to video, I use an FX6 as my main video camera with, or an A7S III or the Alpha One. And they literally cover everything that I need them to do. I have other cameras, um, but I, you know, I, I actually have camera up to 8K now. Yep. So I feel like I'm covering pretty much every base with this anyway. Uh, but really, what are these functions? Uh, which functions are important to you? Because it's, it's something that you, you get it all the time, the, the, the concept of a perfect camera. Mm. Because there is no perfect camera because we all want, we all want different things. Yeah. So, you know, you'll look at, say, the new RED, for example, the Raptor, the control screen is on, operate, is on the assistant side. Yes. So, if you are a one-man band, this is not the ideal camera for you at all. It's for certain market. And so, we all have different things that we look for in a camera. And there will never be a camera that does everything. No. Because I like small cameras. Some people like big cameras. Which, yep. li people literally do want to have a big camera, whereas I really like to have a small camera. If I want to build it up, I can. For me, that's what I like. So there's definitely pluses, minuses to everything. But um, whenever people ask me which camera, I, I get the generic questions all the time. What camera should I buy? Uh -huh. Literally, that's it. No context, no information. And I say, I cannot answer that because I don't know what you use, what, what you already own, your own lenses, experience, uh, what your experience level is, um, or any of these things. It's, well, if you give me this sort of context, then I can give you a better idea. I can tell you what I use, or you could watch my reviews and see why I use them, but I can't tell you what to buy. And I've, I know, I use, I've used a lot of cameras. I've used most of the cameras out there. Um, and there's, there's very few actually bad cameras that's the thing yeah and, and, and this is kind of a sometimes a bit of a double-edged sword because you'll get somebody especially people that are new in the business they'll come up to limited budget and they'll say what camera should i buy and you look at them and think well you probably can't afford sony venice for example forty thousand pound camera something like that yeah. so you you may be going to suggest them well something cheaper 
But actually, the irony is that the cheaper cameras are often more, more difficult to use than the more expensive cameras because they don't have the things that make it easier to do things simply. So it's never, ever an easy question to answer that. And I think one of the problems there is that people aren't able to answer that question for themselves either. And I think that's where we have a problem now. It is because they can't decide what they yeah. want, they have to rely on somebody else. Well, that's the thing, because I find it difficult enough making decisions myself. And they want me to take responsibility for their purchasing decisions by telling them what to buy, which you can't do. I mean, you mentioned like the Venice. So if you always get this question is, if somebody, get, if somebody gave you this camera and this camera, what would you choose? Um, and, and I would always choose the most expensive camera because then I can sell it. Yeah. And then I can buy the cheaper one and have some money. And, and, and that's kind of, um, when it comes to like, you mentioned the Venice. If, if you said to me, you can, you can have a Venice, you can keep a Venice, and, or an FX3, or an FX6, uh, but you can't sell it. You've got to use it. I would, go with, I would say, keep the Venice. I'll use the FX6, because that's the camera for my work, my type of work. The Venice would be completely wrong for my type of work. Uh, for other people, the Venice would be like, yeah, give me the Venice. It's what I want. Yeah. And that, that's the thing. Is so if you are, I don't, who, is anybody here really, really, really rich? No. Nobody? And if you really, really, how much, would you say we're talking like Kardashian money? No? Okay, that's not really rich. Because yeah. that's where we're looking at now. Kard rich these days is Kardashian money. So everything else is like, and most people are millionaires these days with your property. If you add, add up all your cameras that you've got, you're like, oh my God. But it's like, okay, so if you were the richest person, well, you had, money was no object. Literally, buying a camera is like buying a, a cup of coffee. You wouldn't buy the most expensive camera because but it's not right. It may, it's probably not right for you. And it's, there is the, the best, that comes down to defining what is the best camera. Is it the camera that has the most features? Is it the camera that has the most dynamic range? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Most resolution. Would you take dynamic range over resolution? Oh, yeah, every day. Really? Yeah. So if you could get an, if you were a choice between an HD camera that had 14 stops of resolution and an 8K camera, which had 10, what would I you would go for? I would take the the HD camera with the 14 stops of resolution. Interesting. Personally. I don't think I would. I think I would just be so upset with shooting in HD again, having but, not done it for so long. But we did have this discussion earlier. But then again, if you look at what is a true, it, we're talking true 10 stops. Because if you look at true st stops of dynamic range, as opposed to what a manufacturer would say, actually, That's a, lot. a lot of them aren't that much more than 10. They're more like a, you know, 11 and a bit or yeah. something like that. So it's not, you know, we see cameras announced which say have 18 stops of dynamic range. <laughs> Do they? Really? Do they though? Really? Really? I mean, in reality, these things, are, they're never, you know, this is what, you know, I don't work in marketing. I know why they say these, because it is marketing and it sounds great. But anything that says 14 plus stops of dynamic range or whatever it is, in the, everything in reality is, Never quite the same. And, and this is where the whole industry has changed in, the, in recent years, is it's become a numbers game now. Yeah. It, it's no longer about buying the right camera for the job that you are doing. It is about buying the camera that has the biggest numbers. And that's how the marketeers and the manufacturers are trying to sell cameras to us. And I, I get that. It, it's easy. It's very easy to say, well, I, mine's got more than yours, so yeah. you want to buy it. But then they don't explain why that is a benefit and what the implications are. You might have more dynamic range, but yeah. at, at the cost of noise or resolution or whatever. Yeah. I mean, without question, one of the... You know, if we, obviously, image quality is, is essentially it needs to be great with dynamic range. One of the most important features for me of a camera is how easy is it to use? Can you access things quickly? Do you have to go through eight levels of menus to get to a function? Do you constantly have to think about how to do something? That is a pain for me. Any camera that requires, you know, if I am, there's certain cameras where you'll need to, you know, if you change frame rates, uh, you cannot play back a clip from a previous frame rate. You need to go your camera back. All that sort of stuff drives me nuts. I want a camera where I can have shortcuts for things that I need quickly. I want a camera that really I don't think about. 
Because the way that I shoot, I shoot fast. Because I come from a news background and documentaries. I, I don't take long to, to get a shot. I see the shot, and I should be rolling on that shot within five seconds. And there are some cameras where it will take me 30 seconds to a minute before everything is right, exactly right. And I mean, the guys run off by then. Yeah, I mean, autofocus is, is a huge benefit these days. That makes things a lot quicker as well. Um, there's a lot of things... There's cameras that I've bought which I, I've stopped using, sent back, because it's just... Image is great, recording is great, love so much about it, but my God, it's awful to use. Yeah. It's really awful to use. Um, and I would rather... You, and it's... Uh, in a way, it goes back... So this goes back to 2011. So not long after the DSLR revolution, so I was using a 5D. I bought an F3, I think. Had an F3. And then... I bought a Red Epic, and it cost £50,000, whatever it was, stupid amount of money. It was the wrong camera for me. I shoot documentaries. It didn't look good over ISO 320, and it was just, and the codec was all raw, R3D, so it was a pain to work with. It's much better now, mind you. It's really good now. It was just the wrong camera for me, for my work. A very good camera, but the wrong camera for me. So I sold it. I bought a truck, which I still have now, and I bought a C300, which was HD. The slow motion was 720p. And my God, it was a better camera for me. I loved it. It was perfect. It didn't have any of the fancy stuff. It didn't have, I think it was 8-bit still. Yeah, it was. 8-bit. Yeah, yeah. Didn't have raw. Didn't have, you know, I think my, my Red Epic went up to 300 frames a second uh, in 2K. None of that. Uh, it was 120 frames, I think it was, in 4K. And so it's, I didn't have any of this, any of these toys. I went, it was a very basic camera. It shot beautiful 1080 25. There was a piece of cake to work with. And it shot in, in low light. So as a documentary guy, that's essential to me. I don't have the ability or time or people to put up lights everywhere I go. I have to work with what's there. And it was the right camera. And people, you know, did right, raise eyebrows. Really? You've gone from this to this? Yeah. Most people would, you know, you see it on YouTube all the time. They're, shoot, they're running around with uh, uh, an ESR or whatever it is. And they make, suddenly they get loads of subscribers, they get loads of money, and they go and buy a red weapon. And they start filming with that. And you, you have to ask them, what is the reason why you bought this? Is, does this make your workflow better? And they'll go, no, no, it's much slower now. Yes. Why did you get it? Well, because we could afford it now. Yeah. I mean, I'd also also throw into this because I think this is very, it, it's sort of going in where a direction that I'm quite interested in and curious in right now is I'd almost suggest that maybe half the people that are buying full frame cameras now are buying the wrong camera because they, it, it's all the thing. Everybody's talking about full frame now. Full frame, full frame, full frame. You cannot get away from all the discussion about buying ever larger sensors. And you, you have the Aries with their even bigger sensors. And yeah and everything else, and then two days later, it's like, what zoom lenses can I use with this? And you're like, well, is this one that you can use? Yeah, but I used to be able to have a 20 times zoom. Where, where, where's that one gone? And said, so you can't, because the bigger sensor, laws of physics, laws of optics, mean that's either yeah. infeasibly large or infeasibly expensive. Yeah, I mean, And then they're buggered. Because I, I come from a news background, so 17 years of an ENG camera with a two third inch sensor. So that's a sensor which is smaller than you'll get in a compact camera, like an RX100. Yep. Um, and, but it had a 20, well, it was 22 times zoom with a two times extender. And you know, if you've ever used an ENG camera and lens, that, you know, those lenses aren't, you know, they're not that big. And I was able to, you know, shooting news, you need to be able to go from your wide to a tight shot without faffing around. And when I see, um, I did the, I was a judge on the RTS Camera, camera Operator of the Year uh, this year, and it was interesting to see what people were using. And I understand why they were using small cameras, like A7S2s or whatever, it, A7S3s were what we using a lot, in war zones and stuff in yep. Syria, because it's, you know. But for, for straight news, a lot of people were still using large sensor cameras. And I was just thinking, that must be really difficult at yeah. times because you must be swapping lenses a lot. And swapping lenses is always a pain, um, especially with the Sonys because 
you just get loads of dust yes. <laughs> all the time. Um, but it's, it's a pain because you, you're constantly switching. You just want one lens for shooting on that. And that's really only possible with small sensor cameras. Yeah. And, so and it's, it's, it's a big deal because... Yeah. You know, and, and there's also, I think, there's a lot of, of mysticism around this, the full frame look because it doesn't really exist. It, it, the, you can achieve the same look at any size of sensor. Almost. Just, yeah, Almost. but there are, Almost. Yeah, within yeah, reason. Yeah. Yeah. But if you go to a smaller sensor with a wider aperture, I mean, the, the best example is if you take uh, when 30, Super 35 was all the thing before it became mm. uh, 35, we don't use 35, it's all full frame now. But when Super 35 was the thing, you take a full frame lens and put a speed booster on it because you got the same image that you had with a full frame sensor. Yeah. But that's actually just the optics that's changing that look, not the sensor size. So if you can achieve it with a full frame lens and a speed booster, then do you actually need a full frame sensor to achieve that same look? So Alistair, so when I had Super 35 mil cameras, um, like the FS100, 700, yep. I got a speed booster. Yep. Right? Same with the FS7. So when I got full frame cameras like the um, uh, A7S two, yep. blah blah blah, etc. etc. And the FX6 and whatever the FX9, um, I then got uh, medium format speed boosters to put <laughs> medium format lenses on. Then I got a medium format camera with the GFX 100, and then I got um, Hasselblad speed boosters to make that one bigger. So it, for me, you cannot have too big. You know, I'm waiting for, you know, I, if I could afford it and it was any good, which it isn't, the Hasselblad proper medium format yep. cameras, I'd get that. But then I'd want, can I use large format lenses on that? Can I get a speed booster for this? I mean, it's, there's no reason for it. Yeah. I mean, you just, uh, Lauer just brought out a 35mm zero, F0.95. Zero yes. um, so it's the widest 0 0.95 that's come out, as far as I know. Yeah, I think so. Full frame. Um, and it's soft, wide open, um, it's apart from at the center. And, and of course, your depth of field is going to be horrendously difficult, impossible to uh, keep. Uh, it'll go back to, and it's manual focus. Also. So you go back to the, the 5D days of like, eh, I think it's in focus. Um, and then you'll get these people trying to use it on an FX3 with no viewfinder, and I'll be like, good luck with that. Yeah. You're not going to be able to get anything in focus. The only way you'll be able to get anything in focus is with a viewfinder, and then even then it's going to be very, very challenging. One but, oh my God, it looks good though when almost nothing's in focus, though. Yeah. It looks great. Oh, yes. You know, I was just shooting some stills of, uh, of a guy out there, of Mark, just a portrait with this Fuji, and it's got a... Uh, 56, it's a Super 35 or APS-C. It's got a 56 1.2 on it. And I just had to ask him, can you just go straight on to me? I want to shoot 1.2 and it's no good if you're at an angle. Well, I'm only getting one eye. Well, one, one of the things that often amuses me now is I see a lot of people posting images of their brand new full frame camera with their F1.2 lens. They've done an, a, an interview, set, set, set up interview with somebody. Yeah. And it just looks like the background's been keyed in. Like it's chroma key. Yeah. Because the, the background is so immensely out of focus compared to the foreground that they look like they're two different scenes, two different shots that have been composited together. There is a wonderful video on YouTube for the wrong reasons. That I don't like to, to talk negative about anything, but it's, it's worth watching because it... It became such a big talking point, and it was, um, I'm not going to say the channel's name, but it's a guy, he's a photographer who does videos and stuff, he's got a big channel, and he was, he was talking about why he doesn't shoot 4K anymore, but he shot it all on the EOS R on a 50mm 1.2, and he was at this beautiful lake, apparently, I think, I mean, I think it was, you can just about get an idea that it, it was a beautiful lake, but it was, so, every single shot, was so shallow, and I love shallow that field, but it was so shallow, and he just stuck on this lens, and it just was abysmal. And also the autofocus on that, you know, with an old lens like that, is not gonna be the greatest. And with the EOS R, doesn't have any parameters to change things anyway, so you just stuck it. So it, it was pulsing, it was pulsing, and everything was dreadfully out of focus on the background, you couldn't see anything. And it looked terrible. It just looked terrible. And it spawned, um, there's a guy called Camera Conspiracy on Camera Conspiracy Channel where he just completely mocked it. And this, this is where this phrase tone came out of, of. And it's very funny. And it's about overuse of shallow depth of field. And I... But it's cinematic. I, it's cinematic. I love mate. shallow depth of field, but I know when I shouldn't use it. And done, anybody here seen, seen Army of the Dead on Netflix? Is that, so you know, do you know what was unique about that, that film? So he, everything was shot 
at f 0 0.95 in full frame on the red. Um, right. So it was well, whatever, whatever they call Vista Vision or whatever it is. Yeah, so using um, the, the modified Canons, the old Canon 0 0.95. And it looked terrible. It looked, ter it looked different and it looked unique. And, but it looked, I mean, it's so little of it was in focus. And it, the, I think these sort of things work okay for, clo for medium close-ups and stuff. Yeah. But when you go to wide shots and they're separated so much, you see the whole body, but they're separated from the person behind them and the background, it does look fake. Yeah. It looks like a, co a composite, yeah. it, and, which is no good at all. I mean, we always used to use shallow depth of field, even with the small sensors, to disguise a, a grubby boardroom or something to, so, so yeah. that the, the, the marks on the wall didn't look... It weren't so obvious and things like that. But you never ever took it to the degree where the back, where you couldn't tell where they were at all. And if you're going to go take it to that degree by shooting at 0.96 or even 1.2 with a full frame sensor, you may as well just shoot chroma key and just do it anywhere and put whatever background you want in there because you are to totally breaking the link between the person and the environment they're in. And if yeah. you're going to do that, why, why bother having a background at all? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely times when you want it for an aesthetic reason. And there's, as you said, there's times when you want it for a, a practical reason, you know, where you are, need to do an interview for your job and you are given the worst room possible. And if you were using an old 2.3 inch camera, you'd be stuck. You'd well, you had the try camera make, in the corridor. You would have to put your camera so far back to try and get something shallow. But that's what I loved about the 5D when it came out. It's like, oh my God, I can make the worst room. I can get it knocked out of focus a distance of six foot from yeah. me, and it was amazing. But there was <laughs> still a connection between the, the subject and the room. Well, for that, it was just a case of I just didn't want to see the background. Um, well, but okay. when it comes to, Fair yeah. Enough. And I, you know, if you look at my old 5D stuff, I am totally guilty of what we're just saying was, is not good, um, because you did it, because you had it. I had the 1.4 uh, Zeiss, and I shot everything at 1.4. Um, and it looked, it, I liked it at the time because it was so unique. But as time went by, I learned to use the aperture. I learned to turn my hand like this. It was a, took a lot of practice to turn it like this. Like, I'm going to close down. Just, it was like you know, a third of a stop at a time because I didn't want to, it was baby steps. But then I started using it this way. And, but then again, I want that 35, 0.95. I want it because <laughs> I want to be able can. to, yeah. And apparently it gets sharper F8. Awesome. <laughs> But it's one. Of, it's a tool. It's something. It's a tool. Yes. It's something that I would. I, you know, I've had 50 mil 1. Point, uh, 0. 0.95s for a while. I never use them. They're too soft. They're always yeah. too soft. I mean, the, um, the only time I use lenses that fast when I'm trying to shoot the northern lights, and it's bloody dark. And then they're too soft as well, aren't yeah. they? You're not going to get edge to edge sharpness. Northern lights aren't sharp, so you can get away with murder. Yeah, but you want the stars to be sharp, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I true. mean, that's what like the 14 1.4 from Sony. That's a pretty sharp lens it at 1.4 but maybe too wide for that. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. So, but yeah. the, whole, the whole thing is this becomes an obsession, is, is that because guilty as charged, people post a video on, the, on YouTube or whatever, and it, it's really soft, and it has some nice look to it and everything else, and lots of people watch it. They're like, oh, I need to do that too. Mm. And they copy, which is flattering, when they do that, but it's not necessarily what you really want in your corporate video, if that's what you do, or your news story, if that's what you want to do. I mean, it's a whole, shooting news with no depth of field, so you can't see what the hell's going on. Yeah. Oh, by the way, there's a riot going on back there. You yeah. can't see it, but you have to take my word for it. Yeah, yeah. It is, it's daft. Yeah. So we need to think about what we're doing a bit more. We need to think about our equipment choices. Why am I buying this? Mm -hmm. And then we have to try and figure out what the hell is cinematic. Well, there's no, yeah, this, is, this goes back to the whole, we've, we've, there is no such thing as cinematic. As it's, it could, it's, it's Sony things to different people. Um, people, will tell, people will say it's all about, oh, that's, it's about the story. And I say, no, it's not. Cinematic, you know, we're talking about cinematic visuals. It's a different thing. You can have a cinematic photograph if you want. You can have, anything can be cinematic if you want it to be. But that's because there's no real definition. It's not shallow depth of field. Nope. It, is it lighting? Well, yeah, but everything's lighting. Lighting should be good for everything. Composition, absolutely. But then composition should be right for everything, right? Absolutely. So all these things that are ticking. I mean, progressive. I, I would say is probably the only thing. Yeah. 
you know, Definitely efficient not interlace. interlace. That's the main thing, because that's the one, th when I was working back at Sky and working on the documentaries unit and shooting on Betacam SXs in 50i, and the only way I could get it to look like progressive was to remove a field. Eh, it didn't make the image, you know, had it, but it looked great. And they were saying, did you shoot on film? And I went, no, I've just fucked up the image. And I went, oh, this looks great. I'm like, yeah. 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 And, and that's, for me, that was cinematic. I had an old frame store that was broken and only did one field. It was perfect for that. Uh, there you go. So for, you know, when Progressive came into cameras, that was, for me, the main thing, the main movement, the, the, the cadence of it. Everything about it looks really nice. But I come from a certain generation. We both do. And where 25p or 24p is what we like. But there is another generation where, coming up, where... They want 50p. And 60p. And 60p, but not for slow motion. For they like that natural smoothness. And that's, in, that's interesting. I mean, it looks awful to me, but it looks good to them. Yeah. And so, I don't know, it's, it, the interesting thing is it, it's been experimented with in cinema, and it's been flops so far. Yes. But it'd be interesting to see, because people do think, that, know there's something wrong with it, but they can't quite tell. But the interesting thing is when you, it will go back to TVs, because the people at home are probably watching it looking as bad as that because they've got all of these clear... Scat Motion clear, um, smoothing. Yeah, all these adding extra frames on so they don't even realise how bad it is. Yeah. So it's, it's... I mean, that's a nightmare for the filmmaker because you create yeah. a look, you create something in your film with that 24 frames per second cadence and then the viewer watches it and the TV undoes what you've put into your film. And I think that, yeah. that's, that's not right. I think I, that look, should be overridden thrown out if you look at if i look at um i've, I've pretty much figured out roughly what ha, what people watch my youtube stuff on what what do you think most people watch my youtube videos on cats no not the subject so i wish it was <laughs> just the cats but do they put it on their tv they put it on their oh, computer yeah. or do they use their phone which is the most common phone yeah there you go it's phone where everything looks good it doesn't matter what you know. So I done I do I did a review last this year on a little cam wearable camera from Insta360 called the Go2, and the image looked awful. Oh, really cool, fun camera, but the worst image when I'm editing it looked terrible. But then I looked at it on my phone, it looked great. I'm like I was spending I spent two weeks running it through video enhanced to just try and make it look better and just working on it, adding film grain and things. And then by the time I put it uploaded, it still looked exactly the same as the original stuff on a phone. And I have to question, do I need to go through this to make it look good for the best possible viewing experience on the TV? And the answer is yes. Yeah. I still will always try and make it look the best it can, even if people are going to watch it on a phone. Yeah. I've accepted that. It is what it is. I'm not going to, you know... I only watch stuff on my TV. I don't watch stuff on the phone. I don't watch stuff on the computer screen. I watch YouTube and internet videos on my TV. It's the only way I can actually watch them. If I watch them on a phone, because your thumb's always right by, the, the, you know, you start scrubbing very quickly. Yes. Whereas on the TV, you just sit back, you're comfortable, and you tend to watch things much better. So and enjoy it more, I think. You do enjoy just it. Generally. Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is the way we consume TV. Well, this, anyway, it's, it's, this, is, this is your, I think your, this, is, this comes back to, I, I remember very much when uh, digital cinematography was a new thing and there was a lot of discussion, uh, and 3D actually, going back even further, about that cinema experience is that the bigger the screen, generally, your brain goes into a different mode because yeah. it fills your field of view. So when, you're, when your whole field of view is filled by an image, you, you forget all the stuff that's going on around. Yeah. It's when you sit down at home at a weekend, perhaps, to watch a movie, and you turn the lights down and everything else, the only thing you see is that screen. So that's what you focus on, and that's what you concentrate on. Yeah. And then you watch something on your phone, and there's people chatting in the background and all this other... You can't possibly actually be concentrating on what's on that phone properly because there's no. too many distractions. Yeah. So you don't get that same sensation, that same entertainment feeling in, in your psychology because yeah. you're still being distracted. Yeah. And I think this is something that's important. I think something we're losing is everyone now wants to watch it on their phone and they're dipping in and out for two minutes of a video, then they do something else, might come back to it, then they forget about it altogether, and it's like, oh, did you see that video? No, what video? They don't even remember watching it. 
That's and and yeah. it's sad. I started a new YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago. It was just called Wallpaper TV, and it's just long shots, like 10 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour of a view. And you just put it on instead of your black screen, and it's really beautiful stuff. It's for the TV, though. And I was getting people saying, I've just watched it on my iPhone. It's great. I'm like, it's like you just looked at one single shot, which has lasted yeah. 10, 20 minutes on your phone. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's not the, con the point of it is just that instead of having this black slab on your wall, you have something nice. My TV has put art, artwork on it. If you can set it to an artwork mode, it looks really great. Yeah. But I just put on these things because I think they're really nice to just have views of the world. Um, but in, uh, in but Norway, they, phone. they actually have a TV channel that just does what they call it slow television. So they might put a camera on the front of a cruise ship going up and down Norway. And it's not sped up. It's real time. And it's just pretty views of the fjords, yeah. pretty views of the reindeer and things like that. Yeah. And it's actually incredibly popular on the yeah. TV. It's yeah. slow television. That's what they call it. My next video, which is going to be an another long shot, is going to be basically a shot of me in my edit suite staring at my computer trying to come up with the inspiration to start editing. It's going to be like a three, four hour long shot of me just staring at the screen. It's going to be anyway. quite good. Yeah. But like, I really should start editing this. And like, I don't know how to start. Yeah. But, but coming back to the original subject, because we have cameras <laughs> miles and miles away, yeah. Is, yeah. is how do you choose the right camera? I mean, one, one thing, priorities for me, and there's lots of them actually, it's not just one, there's, I want good resolution. Yeah. I don't want I don't want 28K and 100K because unless you're sitting this close to the, whatever the screen is, you're never going to see it. So I don't need that. But I want enough resolution. Yeah. I want enough dynamic range. I want low enough noise. Um, and, I, and as you said, very, very important, a camera that you can use easily and comfortably. I don't want to be yeah. fighting the technology. I want the technology to work with me. So I'm not necessarily going to choose the highest, you know, yeah. a 16K or 8K camera even. I might just choose that 4K one if the other stuff works. I mean, what about resolution? Because you've been doing yeah. stuff with so resolution. For me, that's why the Alpha 1's become my favorite camera. It shoots 8K. I've had 8K with the R5, uh, but the biggest problem with the R5 is it overheats, so you can't rely upon it uh, as a continuous recording. And it's for, I shoot 8K for interviews, and to be able to, um, not for my normal shots for reframing, whereas you, in photography you do that all the time, you know, your crop and stuff, and you can do it in video, but that's not why I'm doing it. I'm shooting because I'll, I'll have an interview, or even just for me on, uh, talking on YouTube, and I can, on a 4K timeline, punch in this exactly the same as when I had an HD timeline and then shooting 4K. So that's why I want 8K. I don't want it to, do, I have the, this, these videos I've said on this channel, which are beautiful, they're in 8K. Have I seen them in 8K? Nope. No, I have not. And most people won't. But they're there in 8K. But, but for the, most of the time I want 8 And the reason why I bought 8K was for simply down to it really makes things easier for me when I'm editing certain types of stuff. But that's important, isn't it? It's certain types of stuff. Because if you take something on a very quick turnaround, 8K, bigger files and everything else might not be what you want. No. So no. you want perhaps to have the ability to shoot at 4K or if you do news in, yeah. in HD yeah. without a compromise. This is part of the, another reason why I like the Alpha 1 is because it does 8K and the 4K full frame looks really nice as well and it has Super 35mm 4K. So it gives me the, all the options I want and... I feel like it's the most, and of course it makes, does great still, so it's the most flexible camera that I've ever used. Uh, you know, it's not as, it's missing things that a, a proper video camera will have, but it has things which a proper video camera doesn't have. And it's small. So for me, it's, it's the perfect camera for what, I, for what I use. But it won't be for everybody yeah. at all. Without question, it's not for everybody. But I am, I, it's the nicest image I've seen out of a camera. And I just love that flexibility from it. And yeah, the file size, it records in HEVC for 4K, but the file sizes are pretty small no, yeah. considering, but you, just, you can't edit with them, you've got to transcode them. Then that's when things go horrible. It's like, it's, that's when you need lots of hard drives because the moment you transcode 8K into ProRes 422, then it's hell. It's like, oh my God. I thought this was like, you know, your original card was 256 gigs of footage. And suddenly, you know, you've got six terabytes. Yeah. And you're like, oh, my God. 
I need more hard drives. I start ending up with having, I use five terabyte drives, and I ending up with having to use two for a project. I'm like, that's crazy. So that's the downside of this. So I then adjusted to not using 8K all the time, to yeah. switching to 4K because I didn't need it. And then it, made it, it, was, it was better because then I could use Super 35 mil mode as well and high frame rates. Yeah. So I like high frame rates. I like resolution. I need dynamic range. I need good audio. Because I, yes. I, I much prefer to have run everything through a camera if I can. I will do it separately if I have to. Um, you know, it's missing a few things for me, that camera, that I would like, like time code and stuff like that. But I, I, I live with it and I cope with it. Everything's a trade-off. There, there is no camera that has everything that I want right now. No. Um, and there probably never will be because there'll always be something else new coming yeah. along. I think we're, I am pretty close, though. The FX6 is very close to the ideal camera for me. The Alpha 1 is very close to the ideal camera for me. So, um, I, you know, there's features which... Have, but they do. Features, your desire changes over the years. Whereas you know, autofocus would have been something I would never have considered as a, as a function. But when I got... I think the change for me was the Canon 1DX... Mark II in 2016, which had wonderful touchscreen tracking, autofocus. I'm like, oh my god, this is so easy. Like, I want that to be in focus. And then the subject will walk towards you, and it was in focus. Like, this is amazing. And Sony have, have caught up now, yep. um, and at times better. And it just makes things uh, now a camera without autofocus is like, oh, yeah, I couldn't what go a back. pain. Um, I have to. I mean, it depends on the lens, of course. I, I did a video uh, for Fuji with their MK lenses using the Komodo, and of course, it's all manual focus. And it wasn't that much of a pain because it has proper mechanics on the lens, proper, you know, which makes it a lot easier to, to do focusing. But if I'm using a stills lens for manual focus, it's like, oh my god, yeah, what a pain. So, but that function has become essential to me. A camera that has, and you see, and that's what's really interesting. You see red. With their Raptor, it does do phase detection autofocus. I mean, the Komodo has it as well, and it's not great, but it shows you that this is their top of the range cinema camera, and they're putting an autofocus. It shows you that it, it's a function that is incredibly useful. Not for everything, oh, yeah. but it's incredibly useful. I, I'm, I'm quite convinced that even the highest of high end cinema cameras will have yeah. autofocus in their next generations. Because, you know, okay, you can have a focus puller and things like that, but a focus puller is generally working slightly behind where the actual focus is. Yeah. There's, they're always playing catch up. When you've got an autofocus system that is responding at the, re at the frame rate of the camera, it's only ever a 60th of a second if you're at 60p or yeah. 24th of a second behind, it's going to be more accurate than a human can be. Yeah. And, and it's, not, it's not, as you say, it's not something you use all of the time, but now it's got so good. For me, the FX9 was the turning point. Yeah. I mean, before the FX9, I poo pooed autofocus. It's like, you poo pooed? Oh, yeah, poo -poo. never poo poo. Auto autofocus was for it'll amateurs. Come back, it'll come back to haunt you. Oh, yeah. Autofocus was for amateurs and, and you know, learn to focus properly, I used to tell people. And then the FX9 came along, and I'm like, hmm, actually. How do I um, change my tune without sounding like an idiot? Because yeah. actually now I'm convinced that autofocus is... What if I said I told you so about important. that? Important. Maybe yeah, I did. Possibly. I mean, one thing that is really good about autofocus, which is, is the t using the technology of it, but not necessarily the actual autofocus part. So Canon, for example, have the, uses the... the um, uh, the what do they call their system? They call dual pixel, dual pixel Peter. autofocus, uh, and you can use it with manual lenses. And then you'll have boxes on the screen on manual lenses showing you when you're in focus. And so that is using the technology of autofocus mm -hmm. to help you with manual focus lenses. So you, you tell me, find me one focus puller who wouldn't go. That's really useful. If you can, t if that sensor can tell me when it's in focus, then I'll take that. Of course I'm going to take that. I'm not yeah. going to have to go via measurements of my eyes. I'm going to see a, an, ass, an assist. It's going to help, really help me. Just like having things like waveforms help you get exposure. Oh, yes. It's exactly the same thing. Before waveforms and things, you're, all right, I'm going to take away every possible way you're going to be able to judge exposure. You're going to have to base it on the screen. And you're going to be like, no, yeah. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I've, I mean, eventually you'll get to know your screen. So that's okay to a point. But all these things are there to help us. Yeah. And that's why you should never poo-poo. Never poo-poo. No, no, I shouldn't poo-poo. No. No. Does anybody here poo-poo? I hope not. Because it's, uh, the t I love, you know, I, uh, I turned 50 this year, 
and I still love all new technology. And new now. and there's, and I I remember when I was, uh, and I was in my mid twenties at Sky, and they said, "Is anybody, anybody here? There's like 30 camera operators, cameramen in the, whatever it is in the t uh, in the department. Who wants to come off the roster and learn how to edit?" And there was three of us, and I was one of them. I'm like, yeah, of course. Why wouldn't I? And the rest of them were like, I'm just going to be a cameraman. Just want to be a cameraman. Just want to shoot. And that sort of attitude is the old-fashioned attitude of like, I'm not going to use autofocus. I just want to shoot manual focus. I'm not. Gonna, you're not accepting anything uh, that can make. You know, when I learned to edit, I became so much better as a cameraman. Yeah. My, 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 I, everything was so much better. Um, so it really helped me to understand these things. Yeah. So technology that these cameras have. And so, you, you know, a lot of the times when people say, oh, I'm not interested in autofocus, they're the people who have cameras which don't have it. They've not used it. Yep. And sometimes it might be jealousy, but other times it's simply because they've not used it. Yes. And I know a lot of people who simply haven't used it and then have used it and like, oh, my God, I, yeah. Didn't know that existed yeah. and it was that You'll good. see this on the FX6 and FX9 forums and stuff and they'll be like, you'll see really experienced guys saying, oh, I love it for talking heads. I love it for this and stuff. This has been fascinating. But you have to learn to drive it. This is one of the things. Mm. It, it is another tool in that toolbox and it's all very well just switching it on and using it at its default settings and kind of hoping for the best. Mm. But you can fine tune it. You can... You can make it work the way you want it to work rather yeah. than the designer at Sony or wherever wanted it. And I think that's yeah. a really important thing to understand with, with autofocus and with all of these things. It, it's not just switch it on, forget. It's switch it on and then learn the nuances of it. Learn if it has face registration, when and how to use that. If you can slow it down or speed it up, yeah. when fast is appropriate, when slow is appropriate. I'm doing a series right now for Sony, training series on autofocus for their cameras and it's the, the most... I wish I'd never done it. It's the most screwed in my head job I've ever taken on because it's so complicated, autofocus, and all the different caveats, permutations, the combinations of lenses and situations, how light affects it, distance from the subject. It's all of these things make huge differences. You need to understand it. So anyway, we're going to take questions, I think. If anybody's got any questions. We've got a microphone there. Hang on, sir. Because people haven't shut up, so it's noisy here. Okay. The question is very simple. Everybody can tell you guys, you are technical guys. Um, one thing that I would Pick like to, to see, mouth. the question is, why can't the emphasis be on teaching people how to shoot, to shoot cameras? Forget about what cameras it is. It could be a Fuji. I know you like Sony. I'm a black magic guy. Because yeah. they say, I, I would like to see uh, someone talk about how to teach people to see the image and bring that image into the camera. I do that. Yeah, I have training courses for that. You can, you can get them. They're very good. They teach you the basics. Because I, you know, I don't think people's first camera should be one that has things like autofocus and things like this. I think you need to learn how to focus. I think you learn to, need to learn how to do all these things yourself. That was always the benefit of film. Yeah, because yeah, because if you, if you, before my time, mate. If, if you ever shot with film, you had to learn yeah. how to compose, to light, to expose, etc. properly. They, it wasn't very forgiving if you got it wrong. Yeah. And I do think there is much too much most of you, you you guys that know me know that i'm a very technical person i do come originally from an engineering background and that is my area of expertise above all else is the technical elements so that's what i focus on personally yeah but i do think there is a serious lack of easily accessible education about the basics now of composition of as you say seeing the light understanding how a shot will work and using practical lights to enhance your mood and all of that. There isn't enough of that now, and there is too much focus on the technicalities, but that I blame on the manufacturers because they sell us cameras based on numbers. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I, I encourage people to, to not buy an expensive camera and just buy something they can afford and learn to shoot with that. Like, uh, you know, that's, you know, Black Magics are great cameras to start with because they have you know, great image, and they, and they have dynamic, nice codecs, and they're cheap. 
Uh, there's also an element of people wanting to be told how to do something now. Yeah. So they'll they'll watch a behind the scenes film, or they will they will go online and they'll ask me, "How exactly did you light that shot?" Because mm. they want to replicate what I've done precisely. They don't want to make their own version of it. Mm. They want to replicate. And, and what that says to me is that actually they're not experimenting. They're not going out if they've got a camera. And it doesn't have to be an expensive camera. It could be a point-and-shoot photo camera even. Yeah. And getting hold of some floodlights, some cheap you know, engin you know, engineering floodlights or the stuff you might use to if you're working on the car or whatever, and playing with the light, playing with that stuff and experimenting. And, and I see so much of this now as people want to be told how to do something rather than being told how to think about how to do it. And, and I, I don't know what that is. I think that's maybe yeah. uh, an, an education thing. Another question? Uh, no? The, um, the question is for me, and unfortunately, it's time to wrap up, guys. Okay. okay. If you can give Alistair and Philip a round of applause. Thank you very much. And I just want to say, we talk about cameras. I made a film, short film, on the worst camera ever made. And it wasn't to prove a point. It was I was given a challenge, and it was a Barbie camera. It was a Barbie doll with a camera there, and it was 320p, and it was 12 frames a second. And I made a film, and people really loved it. And it shows you. I mean, I would never choose choose to use it, but it shows you can use anything, and it can be engaging. But you shouldn't necessarily choose it just because it's you want to like prove a point that you can use something that is cheap. Use the right tool that works for you in every aspect, what yeah. you can afford and the functions that it has, definitely. Right tool for the job and then experiment with it. Yeah. Play it's with like it. that with everything really, isn't it? Yeah.